rebuilt it, and we can feel that rebuilding coming by rebuilding the patriotism. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. Have a great weekend. Make sure you're telling all your friends and family to vote, and let's look forward to next Tuesday being a great day in America. Thanks for listening to The Walmart Show.
pivotal in today's teaching. See, the fact is that the culture has hijacked the narrative on social and moral issues that the Bible has already addressed. And then the culture has twisted those things, distorted and perverted those social and moral issues into political issues, and then told pastors like me and Christians like you to stop being so political. Well, I have news for our culture. God had a say on all these subjects long before there was even a word political. God in the Bible speaks about life, national borders, immigration, economic prosperity, biological sex, marriage, parental authority, Israel, even the environment. It's all in the Bible. God had the first word long before anybody. And so it's important to understand, we're just talking about the biblical issues. And we're looking at what is happening in our culture, especially on the presidential election level, and saying who most closely aligns with the things that the Bible talks about. And if Christians would come together and vote their values, we could change America. We can change America. And we can change America not because we believe in Christian nationalism. That is a disparaging term that the left has thrown at the church because they're accusing us of trying to turn America into a theocracy. I have no illusions. We will not be a theocracy until Jesus comes again, and I pray he would come quickly. That's when we will really be a theocracy in the world. But I say that we can change America just because we as Christians love God and love our country. What's wrong with that? We love God. We love our country. We hold our Bibles. We understand the importance of religious freedom and the values that the Bible speaks about. Because Psalm 33, 12 is true. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. That's what we want for our country. Glad you can join me for the hour today. Going to be joined by Pastor Gary Havrick, whose voice you just heard in just a minute. But we may be living in what could be the most significant time in history. And just think God called you and me to be a part of this generation. We're on the threshold of, consider global government. We're on the threshold of a new money system, on the threshold of artificial intelligence running the world. Who could have imagined? And because you and I live in America, we get the privilege every few years of choosing our leaders. And that happens in the coming days here. And we can choose freedom over tyranny. I just want to play one more clip of Gary Hamrick, and he's making a plea, which I am as well this hour, that if we're not going to be participating in the process here in four or five days, we may be letting evil take over. As disparaging as this sounds, every election has been about the lesser of two evils. The lesser of two evils. And we have to decide what can we do to advance the kingdom of God for the glory of God and stem the tide of evil in our land until Jesus comes. Because if we do nothing, if we check out, if we remain silent, evil will rush into the vacuum. That's why it is incumbent upon every single one of us to be engaged in all of this. Yes, I know, you might have to hold your nose when you go to vote. But the alternative is far worse. What will happen if we don't stay engaged? Listen to me on this. There are 90 million self-identified evangelicals in America who are eligible to vote. 90 million. Of that 90 million, 40 million do not vote. And of that 90 million, 15 million are not even registered to vote. That's 55 million evangelical Christians who are saying, I'll let evil take over because I'm going to do nothing. That's a disgrace. We have no one to blame except ourselves, and we have wicked policies. Righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach to any people. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked are in authority, the people groan. I don't know about you. I'm tired of groaning. I don't want to groan. So it's a duty. It's not just a right and a privilege. It's a duty. We can't remain silent. Gary Hammer is a pastor at Cornerstone Chapel, Leesburg, Virginia. He's been on the air with me previously. Gary, welcome back to Understanding the Times. Thank you, Jan. It's always good to be with you. In just the opening five minutes, we've referenced, you referenced more than I, several issues. Maybe the one issue, and I think you did reference it, that would be Israel. But what do you feel is the number one issue facing, let's say, us and the voters? Probably the synopsis of everything is freedom. What kind of freedom are we going to have if we allow government to become tyrannous? And how are our liberties being threatened on every level? Border security is a threat. Religious 
freedom is a threat when we see the judges that are selected, the justices that are appointed, that those are potential threats to religious liberty. Everything is on the ballot in the sense of there's no one social issue that I think is the greatest. I think they all together pose a great threat if we are not careful to secure our freedoms in the United States of America. I hear from many, they really want to stay disengaged. Reasons would be some have given up watching the evil in Washington. Others say, well, heaven is my home. Others say, I'm waiting for the Lord's return. Others say, I'm tired of this world. Some say, I'm a citizen of heaven, forgetting their citizen of this world, too. Others say the elections are rigged, why should I bother? And there's a little bit of validity to some of those points, but none of them add up to it's okay to stay disengaged. Because, you know, it goes beyond voting. They're just not going to get engaged. Maybe they don't even get engaged in church activity and policy. They just are not connected folks, and they're okay with that, and they're Christians. Yeah, I hear that too, and it alarms me because... Nowhere in scripture does it say that we stop being his ambassadors, we stop being salt and light. We have a mandate on us to make him known throughout the world. And part of that great commission is not only sharing the gospel, which is fundamental, that's central to everything we're about, but then we have to live out our faith. And living out our faith is lived out in practical ways. And one practical way we live it out in the United States of America is to appreciate the liberties that God has given us, that I think voting, this is not just simply a right, but it is a duty because God has entrusted to us a very sacred thing. Many people are flocking to get to America. Why? Because it's a wonderful place with freedom. And so we have been given this opportunity to safeguard what God has entrusted to us. And in Luke chapter 12, Jesus calls out in a parable two different servants, one of whom was wise and faithful and one of whom was not. The wise and faithful servant was the one who took care of what the master had entrusted to him when the master went away. Well, Christ has gone away. He's entrusted to us the wonderful privilege of living in the United States of America. What are we doing to safeguard that? What are we doing to continue to advance him, even if it is through the dirty word of politics? Politics shape policies, and policies shape a nation. So I think it's incumbent upon us to be involved and engaged. We cannot sit it out. Can you shed some light on the Johnson Amendment and how that might affect even today? The Johnson Amendment was passed in 1954. Then Senator Lyndon Johnson put it out on the Senate floor. It ended up being passed and became law. It basically prohibits 501c3 organizations, which includes charities and churches, from engaging in any kind of, quote, political campaign activity under the threat of losing their tax-exempt status. And I think it has intimidated a lot of pastors because no pastor wants to lose the tax-exempt status of the church. But I said to our congregation, Jan, I said, look, if I fail to tell you what God has put on my heart for fear of losing our tax-exempt status, then I'm bowing to government instead of God. And I said, and the likewise, if people are only giving because they want the tax write-off, then they're only doing it to please government instead of God. So we have to be careful about the laws of our land that are sometimes incompatible with God's higher law. For me as a pastor, I have to be faithful to say what God puts in my heart, to preach through his word. And the 1954 Johnson Amendment has muzzled pastors, intimidated pastors, but we can't be intimidated like that. It's a wonderful thing that the government has allowed us to have tax-exempt status, but it's not a sacred cow. There should be no idols that we set up that come between us and the Lord. And so I urge pastors who might be listening, we have to still tell the truth and trust the Lord with the tax-exempt status. The IRS did come after you, didn't they? They did. They came after me after my 2020 election. They waited three years. They came after me in 23. Thankfully, with Alliance Defending Freedom, we were able to retain our tax exempt status, but I don't know for how long. We are seeing parts of the federal government that have been weaponized. I think the IRS has been weaponized. I think the Justice Department, in many ways, has been weaponized. And so we felt kind of the brunt of it, but we trusted the Lord with it. And so far, it's been okay. But again, it's in the Lord's hands. You made a statement here. As a matter of fact, I'll play a very short sound budget. You're talking here about our Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz. Fourteen states currently have what are called transgender health care shield laws. Among them, Minnesota. Governor Tim Waltz signed legislation last year making Minnesota a trans refuge state. Listen to this. If a minor child has been unable to obtain gender-affirming care because one or both parents object, 
the Minnesota law allows courts to have, quote, temporary emergency jurisdiction over the child. Governor Walt signed that into law. They're coming after your children. Gary Hamrick, I'm in Minnesota, as you well know. Michelle Bachman and I are fighting things here. I can tell you that Governor Waltz wants to have this be the law of the land all across America. Thank you for sounding a warning, as I'm trying to do as well. Yeah, and what I just reported came out of the Washington Post. 14 states right now have these transgender health care shield laws, and it's continued to expand. And, of course, the damage is terrible because all of this gender bending has led to biological boys competing in girls' sports and using girls' restrooms and denying the girls' fundamental protection under Title IX, which, by the way, I've always wondered, where are the staunch feminists when they were defending women for different causes? But now, all of a sudden, the feminists are silent when it comes to defending girls, especially in sports and restrooms and all of this. So parents need to wake up and be aware of the fact that the state, in many ways, is coming after their children, which shouldn't surprise us. And that was Hitler's agenda, too. There's so many parallels about what's happening in our time and what we saw unfolding in Nazi Germany, and we have to be wise about these things. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. I have on the line from Leesburg, Virginia, Pastor Gary Hamrick, and he pastors Cornerstone Chapel in Leesburg, Virginia. Some of you follow him on radio, online. And I hardly ever miss his Sunday presentation online, generally on YouTube. You can get other places as well. Gary, let me just ask you, this is a little bit of a loaded question, but on the other hand, it really isn't. And I've written about it. I'll give my opinion, but I want yours first. And the title of the article I wrote, I think I wrote it in July. It was probably right after the first attempted assassination of former President Trump. As I've said, we have to say first attempt, second attempt, and apparently there was a third attempt. The title I gave to what I wrote was, Do We Have Time to Make America Great Again? And then I went on to say that the spirit of Antichrist seems to have been poured out across not just America, but perhaps the world. We saw what happened in October of 2023 in Israel. If that wasn't the spirit of Antichrist, I'm not sure what was. And this is partly because we have a media, academia, entertainment, and even the religious left that seems to be promoting, again, if I can say the anti-Trump agenda, and I don't say that to lift up a man, but it's a movement, and everybody on the left, they're not just sort of opposed, they're opposed to the point where they're picking up a gun, but give me your thought, if you think we have time to make America great, we don't know the mind of God, we don't know how much time we have left before he calls his church home. And if we keep praying, he'll call us home soon. Yeah, do we have time? I think it comes down to, Jan, the idea of how quickly will America respond to God's nudging? Because there are times that God used, quote, a righteous king, even though we know that none is righteous, no, not one. But there were some men after God's heart, like a David, a Hezekiah, and God used righteous kings in authority. And then God used some pagan kings like Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus. My point is, it just depends on how quickly the people will respond to what God is trying to say to them. When Israel rebelled against the Lord, got into idolatry, it took them 70 years to have a time out to realize what they had done. But when they came back from Babylon, idolatry had been purged. And yet it took a harsh thing, like being transported over to Babylonia, which would be modern-day Iraq, to get the attention of the people. So I guess the answer would be, it depends how stubborn Americans are to, if they hear the voice of the Lord, heed the voice of the Lord, and God can use various leaders to try to get his point across then I think that there is hope and there is time. But if we continue to thumb our nose at God and to raise a fist to heaven, then we don't have much time because God has been so merciful to us. How long is his patience going to continue? He's a long-suffering God, but there is a point where he says enough is enough. Yes. I mean, I'm just looking and comparing some of the issues of the day from the fact that the globalists are destabilizing the world, the fact that there really is not a single leader, there's not a president of America that is guiding the world as we've had in the past. There's a longing for a Mr. Fix-It. We're seeing this cheering for Hamas all over the world. I never thought I'd see that. Looking at the Drudge Report, which I don't do very often, it's too painful. They've got a picture of Hitler there, and that's being applied to Christians, conservatives, former President Trump. We're seeing staggering events, not the least of which already been referenced, assassination attempts. We don't want that against any political leader on either side of the aisle. But I think my point is you put all this together... And then you suddenly might have the absence of millions to billions of people in what's known as the rapture. And that wouldn't catch 
the attention of the world, at least the free world, and say what on earth is happening and what does it mean. I'm just pontificating and speculating, Gary Hammer. And I'm with you, and all of the rise of technology, too, and then reports of aliens and all of this. Yeah. I think people will dismiss the rapture and think, well, they've been yeah. captured by aliens. And with artificial intelligence, there's so much now that I think is going to be playing into the end times that we haven't even begun to see. I think one of the things that's troubled me the most in the last three and a half, now going on four years, I'd like to play another soundbite of you, and that would be the wavering support of the nation of Israel and, of course, the importance of Israel in the coming election as well. The subject of Israel is important. Genesis 12, 3, God says, Clearly I will bless those who bless Israel, and I will curse him who curses Israel, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I don't think it's appropriate to support every policy of every foreign nation. I'm sure every foreign nation doesn't support ours. I don't support our own. So I'm not saying that carte blanche, everything Israel does, is right. But what I do know, God says, we better be Israel's ally. Because he will bless those who bless Israel, and God will curse those who curse Israel. And we cannot have our politicians posing up to the enemies of Israel. There must not be daylight between the United States and Israel in terms of our support. We have to stop criticizing the Prime Minister of Israel. That man is in the most difficult position I could possibly imagine someone to be in. And he's under tremendous pressure and scrutiny. When Benjamin Netanyahu came and addressed a joint session of Congress on July the 25th, 2024, I think it was a disgrace that Vice President Harris, as President of the Senate, was not sitting behind him on the dais. But in all fairness, Senator J.D. Vance was out campaigning and he wasn't there either. The United States must show its unwavering support for the nation of Israel because the threat against Israel is great from Hamas, Hezbollah, the proxies of Iran, and we must be putting pressure on Iran and stop unfreezing their assets and doing all we can to show our unwavering support for Israel because he who curses Israel will be blessed and whoever curses Israel will be cursed. And you need to ask yourself which candidate will best support the nation of Israel. Gary Hammer, they're also tipping off Iran as to Israel's plans to strike them. Our government can't make this up. Yeah, it's unfortunate, and I'm not sure if that's intentional because someone doesn't like the United States policies, or if they're not sure if it's been hacked by Iran, but this kind of top secret information being put out there on the internet, it's just appalling. But it's so critical that we support Israel, but we can't forget that on April 7th, 2023, this is a terrorist organization that came and slaughtered some 1,200 Israelis, and they weren't all Jewish. Some of them were Arab Israelis, too. So Hamas doesn't care. They just want to advance their agenda, whether they have to slaughter Jews, which is their primary objective, or even Arabs and Hamas is in their way. I mean, look at how many Palestinians they have been using as human shields. They don't care who they destroy, which goes to show this is the spirit of Antichrist. Anti-Semitism is Satanism, because even their objective is skewed by the way that they are not even only targeting Jews. They'll be happy to have Palestinians die in the process of trying to advance their demonic cause. It's so important that we as a nation stand strong behind Israel. It has not been strong under the Biden administration. It has been weak, and we're slow walking our support in ways that is not beneficial to the nation of Israel. What do you feel is the most important issue for the church today, not necessarily just my listeners in general, but for the church today, and I think we're possibly talking about it right now, obviously salvation issues are number one, but better understanding theologically and other ways, things we're talking about, policies, is hugely important for the church, for the pulpit, for the pastor today, I think. I do too. We have to be equipping people with the word of God. When we no longer are teaching the Bible from cover to cover, we are creating illiterate people who do not understand God's ways, God's standards, God's heart. So now we have illiterate Christians sitting in the pews. They have no sense of urgency. They have no sense of winning the loss. They have no sense of how to respond to the cultural chaos. Why? Because they're not being properly equipped. We have churches now, many who are hanging rainbow flags yeah. on the front door of their churches. They are not proclaiming the gospel. They're proclaiming social justice. So now you no longer have a strong church body 
because you have weak preaching. That's to me the greatest threat because if you stop teaching the Bible and teaching the Word of God as the authoritative Word of God, then the people will not be educated on any of these issues we're talking about. No wonder they're going to be ignorant about Israel. No wonder they're going to think a woman's right to choose is okay if you want to kill your babies. They don't have any standard. They don't have any compass. And that is the Word of God. So that's why pastors have to be teaching it to equip God's people. We don't have an ardently pro-life candidate, and we're criticized for that. How do you respond to that? I am disappointed. President Trump has come out talking about how he's in favor of a 15-week ban, which is better. It yeah. sounds a whole lot better than saying, I'm for abortion without restrictions, which is what Kamala is saying in the Democratic platform. But what people don't often understand is that even the CDC's own numbers tell us that 95% of all abortions happen in the first 15 weeks. And so when someone is going around saying, I'm for a 15-week ban, you're basically saying, I'm okay with 95% of abortions. And that is troubling to me. We don't have a strong stance on life like we once did. You look at the Republican platform in 2016 and in 2020, each of those had about 1,300 words to defend life and the importance of life. In 2024, it's been pared down to just 90 words. So we're not going in the right direction on this issue. And that means that there is no clear pro-life candidate. Now, you can say, yes, Donald Trump's policies would make for less babies killed. And so, as I said in one of the audio clips you played, sometimes politics is about the lesser of two evils. That is better than, obviously, abortion without restrictions, but it still isn't what I wish because when you honor life at all levels, you shouldn't even want a 15-week ban. You should want life at all stages, at all costs. How can you encourage pastors in the moments that we have left? You gentlemen have one of the toughest assignments. I was actually working side by side with my pastor when I was 18 years old, which is more than 10 years ago. I know what you gentlemen go through. And how can you encourage pastors in light of what we've talked about here? I just always am haunted in a good way by James 3.1, which says that not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because those of you who teach will be judged more strictly. And I just always take that to heart to mean I have to be faithful in the comfortable times and in the uncomfortable times, in the comfortable teachings and the uncomfortable teachings. Sometimes God's word goes smooth like ice cream, and other times it's like eating Brussels sprouts, but it's still good for you. And I'm always reminded, James 3.1, I have to stand before the Lord one day, and I need him to say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. I just want to encourage pastors, don't be intimidated by the culture. Don't be worried about the numbers or dollars. God's going to take care of you. God builds his church. You just be faithful to teach the word, love the sheep. That's what my pastor Chuck Smith always said. He's like, we want the people, the sheep, to be the best taught and most loved sheep. If they feel cared for and well taught, then you've done your job. I'm trying to please an audience of one, which is the Lord. And not worry too much about what other people think, just what the Lord thinks. Pastor Gary Hamrick, Cornerstone Chapel, Leesburg, Virginia, part of the Galway Chapel stream. Pastor Gary, thank you so much for joining me today. We'll stay in touch, my friend. Appreciate all you do. Thanks, Jan. I appreciate you as well. See, just a quick heads up here, because Chosen People Ministries and Moody Bible Institute are combining and cooperating to host a summit opposing anti-Semitism. That's going to be Saturday, November the 9th. And heading that up, my friend, Dr. Mitch Glazer. Mitch was my first ministry partner some years ago. He's president of Chosen People Ministries in cooperation with Moody Bible Institute. We'll be at Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, Saturday, November the 9th. We support Chosen People Ministries. They've been sharing the gospel with the Jewish people since 1894. We highly support this organization. Many of you write me and say, who can we support when it comes to reaching out on behalf of the Jewish people or against anti-Semitism? Saturday, November the 9th at Moody Bible Institute, and that would be Chosen People Ministries and Moody Bible Institute. Find all info, chosenpeople.com, chosenpeople.com. And remember, under the direction of our own Pastor Josh Schwartz, we have installed a prayer wall on our website, posted prominently on our home page. Not only can you post prayer requests, readers can check a box letting the person know they have been prayed for, and folks can see that there is a community of people praying for them. And one more item on our home page, you'll see a lengthy position paper drafted by our own Michelle Walker. It's a major page warning. Our, our own Governor Tim 
walk with them to show off my work as he was for many years. He took the battle in Washington and of course he's serving as one soon as done. Say, when I come back, I'm going to be joined by three men that I think you will benefit greatly from in part two of my programming. Don't go away. We hope you'll stay in touch with us online. rescue in the next chapter who comes to the rescue well you got to read a couple more chapters it's such chapter 19 is the lord jesus christ when the heavens are torn back and the lord jesus comes riding a white horse the goal is of the globalists that are controlling and influencing 
even our leaders around us, more than we want to admit, is that you own nothing by 2030. You watch the World Economic Forum at the beginning of the year. They usually focus on climate change and all the other garbage that they do. But what was the main thing they focused on? Misinformation, disinformation. Ronald Reagan said, the scariest nine words you'll ever hear is, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. We'll be lucky if we hear that, right? Yeah. So we need to be caring for ourselves and preparing for what could happen. Well, we've talked tonight some about finances. And Jesus talked a lot about finances. Jesus goes on and says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Welcome, everyone, to the question and answer part of our Thursday night event. If you were with us last Thursday, we didn't have time to get to all the questions and answers, so we'd like to do that right now. Joining me is Pastor Mark and Pastor Josh, and there were a number of questions that were sent in. We'll get to all of them, but I think first and foremost, Mark, the main question that we're always asked is, this financial collapse is coming. We can't sustain what we're doing right now. What do I do with my finances, with my investments, with my hard assets? Should I withdraw my money out of the bank? I hear that all the time. So what should people be doing, especially biblically, if we read the Bible, what should they be doing? A couple things. If you join us October 10th, we talk about the five asset classes. Now listen, everyone's net worth. It doesn't matter what generation you're in or what part of the world you live in. There's basically five assets that all of your wealth is going to be tied up in. So you need to go back and kind of watch that to catch up where we're at. And so the question constantly comes to Jan, myself, these two guys, as to what's the next step. Now, number one, we're not financial advisors. And there are spiritual things that you and I need to do. We need to put our trust not in the uncertainty of riches, doesn't matter how much you have or how little you have, our trust needs to be in God. Mm-hmm. And so there's a number of spiritual things, but then it comes to the practical elements of the book of Proverbs and how we apply the wisdom of God in this economic collapse is coming globally. And so I think there's a series of things we need to do. Number one is this. When you think about your own finances, is you and I need to understand our net worth. And many of you are looking at us and going like, I don't even know what that means. You need to go into accountant and spend them $200 and say, I don't have a net worth statement. Would you help me make one? That's going to be able to let you look on a piece of paper, and it'll talk about your cash assets. It'll talk about the five asset classes that there are and what you currently own. And then it'll talk about the liabilities, your credit cards and your car payment, all those things. And we'll deduct that, and then we'll have your net asset value, what you really are worth financially. And some of us are going to be shocked because some of us have negative numbers. You should be working and building assets for the glory of God. Because when you look at the book of Proverbs, the wisdom of God is during your productive days, your younger days, you should be gathering to meet your own needs, to advance the gospel and to help others, and then planning for the future. Proverbs 6, for example, go to the ant and sluggard, observe her ways. How she works with diligence and then she stores up. The first thing is you need to understand your net worth. And that's the reason when people ask us questions, it's complicated because everyone's net worth is different. If your net worth is $100,000 between the equity you have in your house and other assets, cash or stocks or so forth, that's going to be different than if you have 500000 or if you have $2 million or if you have a negative number, right? So the first thing is you got to figure out what your net worth statement is. The second thing is you need to look at the five asset classes And as you work with diligence and you meet your own needs and you advance the gospel, you and I should be giving joyfully unto the Lord, then we need to buy assets. And those assets grow in wealth. And again, the Bible talks a lot about this, guys. And nobody even studies these passages, but there's a lot of wisdom God gives us. And so as we build wealth, and I think what you got to do is you got to look at those five asset classes and say, which one is more for example, cash assets are vulnerable right now than commodities like gold and silver or land. Real estate's another one. You know, depending on what happens in the election, if you own a business, the EPA and all of these other government agencies are going to be unleashed against businesses. And historically, you want to invest in a business. You want to start a business. Some people call it a side hustle or whatever, and then it grows into something greater, and that's awesome. All of these five asset classes are under attack. So you guys ask, which one is the best at this given time? Again, I'm not a financial advisor. You're going to need to get with some others. But here's the need. But I say you need the wisdom of God. You need to ask God. But I think there's another level that people need to be thinking about. And up until this time, we've always been saying, like, how do I make good decisions with my own assets? And that's a good question. They have a clear conscience before God to do what's right. But here's the bottom line, friends. 
all five asset classes are under attack. You see, in the past, in our economy, because we are a constitutional republic and we had a free enterprise capitalistic situation, when one part of the market was in trouble, there was opportunity in the other. So, for example, if CDs were not making money and it wasn't good to have cash on hand, you could invest it in land or you could invest it in stocks. And so if the stock market was going down, you put your money in land. If land was going down, you moved it over to stocks. And so you, you just moved your money around accordingly within the five asset classes. Now all five are under attack. And he said, well, where's the best thing to do? i tell you what the best thing to do is. Save the republic. You need to go and you need to vote. There are five reasons that God destroys nations. And America is insulting God. I'm just going to tell you, he destroys Sodom and Gomorrah because of their immorality. God is pro-family. God's pro-homosexuality, as we see in the Bible. And he destroys nations for that. God's pro-Israel. God is pro-God. The idolatry that we see, God destroyed the nation, for example, in Syria. God's pro-justice. That's why he destroyed the world with the flood. So the lawlessness that's being embraced and calling good evil and evil good in the days in which we're living is lawlessness. And listen, if this continues, not only will we lose all of our assets and sure enough we'll have nothing in 2030, but the consequences are just massive for the whole world. And so I would just encourage you, there's a certain sense where individually we need to look at our own assets, understand where we're at with our net worth statement, make the best decisions we can with our assets. But then we can take a step back and say, if we don't save the republic at this point, by God's grace, using our opportunities, by voting, standing with Israel, electing people, they're not perfect, they're all sinners, but electing people that represent biblical values and biblical principles so that we can have the blessing of God, it's going to be critical. When you lose every policy that a politician puts in place has a consequence, not just in this life, but in the life to come. And not only that, but also the judges they put into place. And so whoever gets elected, they're temporary. They're just a personality, and they might be frustrating to you with the personalities that are involved. But remember this, the policies are important, and the people that they put in place as judges matter. And what we've been seeing is prepare for the worst case scenario. If we stay on this trajectory, like Mark said, not only will we lose the republic, but I feel and fully believe that we'll lose the opportunity to preach the gospel openly because, as we said Thursday night, they're coming after the church. So what Josh and I have been talking about in some of our programs is, and we did this in law enforcement, we always trained or prepared for the worst-case scenario. So I ask yourself, what's the worst-case scenario? Do I have enough food on hand? Do I have enough water on hand? Do I have a generator? Do I have all of the hard assets? And Mark talks about some of those things. Having hard assets on hand, if the worst case scenario happens, if there's a, an electrical outage, if there's a cyber attack, a cyber attack would literally shut down the entire country, the entire world. So preparing for those kinds of things, the worst case scenario, then you don't have to deal with it even when the time comes. You don't want to be fighting people for food and supplies in the market. Yeah, you're absolutely right. But even with all this, we always get the question of, but I can't vote for that person. How do you answer that question? Whether it is Donald Trump or Kamala Harris, I can't vote for them, so I'm not gonna vote. Is that a correct answer with any of this? I would suggest to you, again, you're looking at personalities. I can't vote for that person. You look at personality. What you gotta do is look at the two people that anti-republic and anti-capitalism that they don't want to give you their programs. Right. 
but you want to look at their policies and say which one is pro-family, which one is pro-Israel, which one is going to support the First Amendment. As you remember Thursday night, we showed videos of four politicians in America that are saying the First Amendment is a problem. And the First Amendment starts with religious freedom, and then secondly, it has to do with free speech, and then thirdly, peaceful assembly, and then petitioning the government. So if we lose the First Amendment, and Jan and I talk about this all the time, man, if we end up losing the Republic, i.e. the rights, inalienable rights, and the government doesn't recognize all inalienable rights because they believe that they give them to us rather than God, Jan and I look at each other all the time and say, well, we're going to the gulag. So save the Republic, friends. Vote and honor God the best we can, and let's see what happens. Right, and the First Amendment is a right, not a privilege. This is something that we are given as an inalienable right from God. Well, staying on the subject of cash and finances, a question came in. With this new cashless economy that's coming very soon, if it does not require a mark, can we participate in this since it's the only way we'll be able to buy or sell? At what point do we bow out? And people get confused because they think that at some point the church is going to be involved in taking the mark of the beast. Let's talk about that because that's a huge point that I hear wherever I go. The reality is this, if the Lord does not operate the church in the next three to six months, I believe, we will be entering into a cashless society, into a electronic currency, maybe even central bank digital currency. As time progresses, we're going to be, in essence, forced to be part of that system. So I don't know that there's any way to necessarily bow out. So we're going to have to use it for God's glory and the proclamation of the gospel the best that we can. Let's explain to people, this is not the mark of the beast. No one is going to take the mark until midway through the tribulation. The church isn't going to be here for that. So please, once and for all, do not worry about taking the mark of the beast unless you're here during the tribulation. And that means you have a belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and you need to today. So if you, you skip that whole seven years and you're with Jesus in heaven, so believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved and miss out on the wrath that is to come. But you're absolutely right, kid. The mark of the beast doesn't come until halfway through. So when someone overlays digital currency on top of that list, you got to have digital currency if you're going to control all the buying and selling, right? So I think we're all kind of agreement on that, rightly so. But that does not mean it's the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is going to be another element that ties with God. Again, you can read about that in Revelation 13. It's just the setup for this system that will be in place. We know this system has to be in place for the Antichrist. He's not going to have time to set all this up. If you read the book of Daniel, if you read the Revelation of Jesus Christ, verse 3 and a half is going to be much of a The church isn't going to be here. There's going to be a lot of chaos, confusion, and violence after that. So there's not going to be time to put this up. But this, all this being set up right before our very eyes, I think it's exciting for the generation that gets to witness that. People often ask me, should I use digital currency when it comes up? Friends, you and I are not going to have a choice. And it's just like you and I use greenbacks right now, the U.S. dollar. The Fitfax currency is not based on gold, it's based on subtle cars. You remember Nixon took us off the gold standard. We can go back and you can see, I've traveled around the world, I've used money in all these different countries, right? Because they've got to have some sort of monetary system. And so as America moves to now this digital currency, do I like it? No, I do. I think it's the best thing for America. No, I think we should go back to the gold standard. I think we should do a lot of things for the restoration of the republic. I don't think that's going to happen, unfortunately. But I don't think we're going to have a choice. And I'm not sitting here, like, afraid of that. Why? Because we're looking for Jesus. We're anticipating the rapture. And we're going to live by his grace through whatever complex situation we find ourselves in. Absolutely. And that kind of segues into another question that came up. Should we try to prevent the World Economic Forum's 2030 agenda? What are we to do? Well... Some of these global events, we're not going to be able to change. If it's God's will that we're racing towards that time, then that's going to happen. But we've all talked about this. If we don't vote mm -hmm. and put a reprieve on some of this, then, yeah, this is going to come full scale. I think it's so important that we vote and we vote for at least a majority of our value system. We might not agree with everything that every candidate has out there, but if you really want to make a difference, we know that you start locally. You start your family, you start your community, your city council, your county board, your school board. Your sheriff is a huge factor in implementing what mandates may or may not be enforced. So start locally, 
before you start thinking nationally or globally. And that's the way to combat the influence of the unelected globalists, yeah. is to actually elect people who will fight against them. I would also throw this out there when we think about the agenda that is coming. The World Economic Forum, I've read, has a billion dollar budget a year. Billion dollars. They're pushing to make this happen. Now listen, you and I as followers of Jesus should push back against the darkness. But at some point, because our iniquities are going to be full as America, and Jesus has completed building his church from every tribe, tongue, and nation, there's going to be a point here where God gives us to the so there's going to be a point, a point that, remember this, Jeremiah was sent to the nation of Israel. They had already reached the temple. So God was there. He's like, God, you know, you can't let Israel suffer this way. You can't let the nation, we're going to say it this way, the republic fall apart. And the bottom line was, God says, you know, because of this, even if Moses was here, even if Elijah was here, even if Samuel was here, it wouldn't matter. It's not that you're a bad prophet, it's not that you're a bad preacher. It's too late. They're going into judgment. And so you are the voices of the last day. So this is what I would say. Number one is this. We need to be watchmen on the wall and say, hey, this is coming. Beware. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He will be saved. Number two, because we are in a constitutional republic and we have some rights today, we do need to exercise those rights as much for righteousness as possible, not only for our own good, but for the good of all of our unsaved people around us. And not only that, but also for the whole world. And then thirdly, we need to anticipate and expect there will be a tipping point here where it's not going to matter. And God's revelation will be fulfilled when he removes the church, he removes the restrainer. You know, the other night I was pondering this. You can see we are just on the cusp right now, Josh, where if the restrainer is removed, which is the Holy Spirit embodied in the church, if the church is removed, the restrainer is removed, man, this whole thing just erupts. Exactly. Yeah. And like we said, it's set up for that right now. If the Antichrist came on the scene shortly thereafter, he would be handed the keys to the world, and they'd be off and running. Kim, there's a question on here that I think you addressed a little bit of that I think we need to hit. It says this, unexpected hurricanes have hit southern states recently. Will any sort of disaster come to, say, Minnesota, and what could that be, and how do we prepare? All you have to do is look what happened in Florida. They weren't expecting tornadoes to happen. Well, I live near a town in Wisconsin where their whole town was wiped out by a tornado. These cataclysmic events could certainly happen anywhere. Flooding, hurricanes, tornadoes, cyclones, everything that can happen. But the question is, and we get this question a lot, is this God's judgment on us? Is God judging us? God's wrath? Is this God's wrath? Or is this just nature? It was brought up the other night during the program what the government is actually doing to influence the climate, to influence the actual weather. They're seeding the clouds. We've heard of news reports that they're using lasers to influence the climate. So you start messing with God's creation, whether it's climate, right now. You mess with God's creation, and there's going to be consequences, I believe. Not only do we got to ask the question disasters for Minnesota, but for the rest of the country. Quite honestly, there's natural disasters. And we talked about three possibilities. Here are some other disasters. Obviously, and maybe we this, but I mean, you think setting because of the southern world and because of the lawlessness of our leaders ignoring the law. I literally have acquaintances who are down on the southern border and they're watching these buses pull up and all of these military-age young men, Chinese, getting off crossing the border. And we might wake up one morning and find ourselves in a serious situation. I mean, if they attack the grid, internally attacking the grid, you think about winter time coming, and somebody doing that here in Minnesota, it would be catastrophic. Yeah, they're not just allowing it. They're intentionally letting these people in here. To overturn the country, to overturn the republic, Transition to Marxism. And that elite control of everything. And like Marx said, you may wake up one day, I don't know if you dealt with this group of foreigners that come in and they take over city and or apartment complexes, and they know once they get invented, it's very difficult to remove them. And we're seeing that across the country. This is a very 
dangerous time for our country, I believe. Second Timothy 3 tells us that in the last days, perilous times will come. Folks, we're living in those perilous times right now, and that means dangerous times.